Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Rise of the Phoenix and this video is going to be the final tier list video that I do for commanders, at least for the moment. It's going to focus on the good faction tier two commanders. As I've said in these other tier list videos, I don't think that I have enough experience with or against tier three commanders, at least it's not ones with high levels of respect. Uh, in order to make an accurate tier list. And my goal with these is to be as accurate as possible as of the patch that we are currently playing on. I'm recording this on February 23rd, 2022. As always with these tier lists, things are subject to change based on balance changes. So hopefully nobody comes like eight months from now and says, oh my gosh, you're super wrong because this commander is actually amazing. Uh, without realizing that this is a an old video at that point. Anyways, if you do enjoy my content, please consider liking this video and subscribing to my channel. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We will jump right into the tier list. We are going to put Frodo and Sam at the Frodo tier. These guys just aren't very good. There was a very popular video by Chiskel floating around about Frodo and Sam countering the Witch King. It's actually quite an interesting video if you look at the method that the player used, the player that sent Chiskel that battle report. Um, basically, it relies on Frodo and Sam's Ring of Madness to make the Witch King's army go crazy and kill themselves in the first few rounds of combat. Um, very clever little tactic there. However, the fatal flaw and the reason that I don't think Frodo and Sam are a true counter to the Witch King uh, is that it's just not a reliable strategy. If that madness doesn't go off or even if it goes off and then the units just resist the madness and attack you anyways, your army is going to evaporate instead of the Witch Kings. So that's why I do believe Frodo and Sam are still really really unusably bad unfortunately because they're quite cool characters in the lore all right next up i'm going to go this is actually so hard after this next pick because good side has so many good tier two commanders it's actually crazy next up denethor f tier this guy just isn't very good i think most people know that by now not much to be said about that in that regard now, what's going to be kind of weird is I don't know that there are any true C or B tier, tier two good side commanders. Um, the rest of these guys are all just really, really good. I'm going to go ahead and put Arwen. I want to put her at A tier. Maybe she's B tier. I don't know. I think I think she's still A tier. Uh, Arwen has access to plenty of healing and solid damage reduction when she is respect 5, and actually a pretty ridiculous amount of healing when she hits respect 5. All of these things make her quite a good commander choice for taking tiles in the early game. Uh, she does, in my experience, tend to get outscaled by some of the truly S-tier commanders by the time everybody is level 50, running full armies and all of that. Um, but uh, she's still good. I mean, just because she's not S plus tier doesn't mean that she's not good. She's still a pretty freaking good commander. Uh, if you happen to like get her invite and or just feel like investing in her, take her to R5, use her as an early game tile taker, use her as a draw commander to stall for time, uh, and use her to farm Balrogs and Dragons as well. She's good at that. I will also be placing... This guy whose name is currently escaping me. Let me open my game real quick. This is actually kind of embarrassing that I forgot his name. There's so many dwarves. Balin. I thought that's what it was. I just didn't want to say the right thing. All right. Balin is at A tier. I think there's actually could be an argument for him being S tier specifically for Erebor because his bottom R0 tree has uh, all, all the skills have to do with dwarves and he can make 
uh, you know, Dwarves quite a lot more powerful with those skills. Otherwise, he just has the other things that make the Dwarf Commanders good. He has anti-burn damage, which is extremely useful for PvP against evil factions. He can do a pretty respectable amount of damage. He doesn't do quite as much damage uh, as Gimli or Dwalin or Dane. But he trades that damage for some tankiness and sustainability because he actually can bring some crowd control and some healing to the fight. So still a super solid commander. I think his downfall is kind of that he shares a respect item with Gimli. And in my opinion, Gimli is quite a lot better. Uh, if you're going to only ever play Erebor, which I suppose some people are probably only ever going to play one faction, uh, but if you're only ever going to be playing Erebor, he might actually be pretty much on par with Gimli. So if you'd rather have a commander that does bring a little bit of sustain and crowd control to a fight over a pure glass cannon, he could be a good option for you. We're going to go... So technically he should be there. Next up, I'm going to go with Tier 2 Aragorn. Put him above Balin. Overall, Aragorn is just a pretty pretty solid all-around commander. Um, I've been using him as one of my top three commanders so far in this restart. I guess I can go ahead and pull that up and show you guys how he's looking. So at this point, he is a bit behind Gandalf and Eowyn uh, as they've moved on to taking 200 tiles. And I don't really think Aragorn, I mean, at least not compared to these two, um, is quite strong enough yet to participate in 200 tiles. I think he would just lose way too many troops. However, he does bring a lot of nice stuff to the table. Dunedain Chieftain is a pretty respectable R0 title, especially once you get to 1515, army HP plus two, pretty good. He has a lot of damage skills, Cole the Weak, Anduril, a chance to proc extra damage. So this is kind of like a damage skill. Behind Strider, he gains access to Precise Blow, which has Pursuit, which can be important in some situations. He has Raid, which is a really nice damage skill. And if you happen to get him to Respect 5, for 3 total points, he can give Men Stun Immunity. So that is pretty solid, particularly if you're playing as Rohan or Gondor. Also, if you're playing as Rohan or Gondor, he has access to Nobility. So he can kind of be played, in my opinion, as a pure glass cannon damage dealer, picking up just a whole bunch of damage skills. Or he can be used as sort of an army buffer type commander for Gondor or Rohan. You can take Dunedain Chieftain, pick up Brawling Training, which is a pretty nice damage boost. It only hits enemy melee units, but normally that's two-thirds or 100% of the enemy army. I'm not a super big fan of well prepared if you don't have him at higher levels of respect you could put some points into that but i think if you do have him at r5 nobility sun and moon splendor and hidden air are going to be better options for you so just a pretty solid overall commander not quite good enough to hit s tier or s plus tier but quite respectable nonetheless and let's round out our massive list of A-tier commanders with Aomer. So he is one of the three primary cavalry commanders. I suppose Gandalf the White is kind of a cavalry commander too. Anyway, that's somewhat besides the point. The primary cavalry commanders being Theoden, Aomer, and Eowyn. A Aomer's real big downfall is he's just not as good as Theoden, and he shares a respect item with Theoden. And so it's really hard to justify picking up Aomer and taking him to respect 5, when instead you could just have a respect 5 Theoden, who is absolutely absurdly good. Just for fun, I'm probably going to pick up Aomer instead of Theoden out of the Season 1 Glory Days chest. Uh, I have a hot take that at super high levels of respect, which I'll probably never actually reach, um, I actually think that Aomer might outscale Theoden at really high levels of respect and gear. Not positive on that. I will say his unique item 
is a bit better than Theoden's unique item, in my opinion. But now we're talking the realm of Respect 10, Tier 2 Commander, which isn't necessarily particularly viable um, for a lot of players. I, I've definitely never had a Respect 10, Tier 2 Commander. Hopefully one day it'll happen. I just have to stop doing all of these restarts. Solid Cavalry Commander... Um, if Theoden didn't exist, he would probably move up to at least S tier, but Theoden exists, so feels bad for him. Next up, I'm going to put Legolas at S tier. This guy is essentially a clone of Lurtz, except that he's an elf. Either way, Lurtz and Legolas, extremely similar commanders, once they hit respect 3, they are super solid damage dealers. They just deal tons and tons of damage. Both of In both of the cases, kind of their downfall is being class cannon in that they can't do anything to keep their troops alive or help their troops out. So you just throw a bunch of tanky units on Legolas and let him shred things in the same way that Lurtz shreds things. So since I've talked about Lurtz pretty extensively on this channel, you know, not too much more needs to be said about that. Coming in slightly ahead of Legolas, in my opinion, is Gimli. Gimli can be built, and probably should be built, also as a pretty glass damage type damage dealing commander. Um, and this is kind of a, it depends on how you look at it sort of scenario. If you're only ever going to have either of these two guys at respect three, I think Legolas is probably better, but once we start moving into the realm of Respect 5 or Respect 10 or even higher than that, I think Gimli can start to outscale Legolas because he has access to a wider array of damage abilities that he can take advantage of. So I think Legolas is going to start running out of really good points to invest in sooner than Gimli is. You can also use Gimli is kind of a army buffing commander if you're using dwarves and elves. Uh, maybe it would work out. I kind of feel like it's better just to build him for full-on damage and just watch him shred things. And moving up to S+, plus, we have our final two commanders, probably to the surprise of no one, Theoden. This guy is just ridiculous once he gets to respect 5. You pull him up in game, for those of you who aren't familiar with him. So I will say... Oh, I have a, a thing I need to give to Aomer. Sorry, Theoden. Uh, I will say that below respect 5, he isn't particularly anything stellar. He has access to Rohirrim, which is a fantastic title. Riding Excellence is also good. If you're playing Theoden, you're probably just going to completely ignore Cleave, completely ignore Renewed, and all of that. Just because his other options are so much better, at Respect 3, he gets AO Red Leader, which lets him heal things. He gets Flanking and Mounted Combat, which you'll probably ignore those, unless he's not Respect 5. Uh, the reason that this guy is so ridiculous, in my opinion is this title right here, Horse Master. For your entire army, if they're a mounted unit, gets plus one attack per point. So the quick math on that says they get plus 15 attack, and at 15 points, they also gain plus five HP. This is so crazy because plus 15 attack is the equivalent of having five extra fully upgraded weapons that have also a plus attack on them because weapons max out at plus three attack I actually do golds go to plus four i know for sure purples go to plus three so and i mean not that many people have fully strengthened gold weapons anyway so realistically speaking this is the equivalent of having five extra plus three attack weapons and he can also be running around with a plus three attack weapon right so overall, this guy can easily add plus 18 base damage to cavalry units. And the reason that's important is because base damage is then increased further 
by other things such as Rohirrim. So Rohirrim gives mounted units a stacking 0.6% damage buff at 15 points. That's 9% damage buff increased by speed. For quick math, we'll round up to 10%. So at three stacks, that's a plus 30% damage buff. And since this is modified by speed, do keep in mind that it could be, and oftentimes will be, more than just 30%. But if we increase 15 by 30%, that is 19 and a half damage that he is adding to his army. Additionally, the plus five HP is actually kind of ridiculous when you do the math. I'm gonna not do the math for the sake of this video's length, but this is actually a better army HP buff than Dunedain Chieftain if you're running all cavalry units, which obviously as Theoden you will be. So if you do have this guy at respect five, in my opinion, what you want to do is max out his respect five title max out his Respect 3 title, max out Rohirrim, and then you can put extra points into Chaotic Retreat and Riding Excellence. I would not mess around with Renewed or any of his actual damaging skills because he's just not going to do that much damage. That's not his job, and that's fine because he is an absolutely phenomenal commander as he is just buffing up those mounted units to ridiculous levels. And finally, we are going to put Gandalf the Grey at S plus tier. It's actually, I wasn't sure which of these to put as higher on the S plus tier, as they're both just completely phenomenal commanders. But I'm going to put Gandalf as a bit higher, particularly because he is so good as any faction that you play as, whereas Theoden really needs... Uh, Gondor or Rohan so that he has access to tier 4 cavalry units. I mean, he can still do a lot of work with T3 cavalry, but it's just having access to those T4 units just makes him all that much better. Whereas Gandalf, I mean, you can just put this guy in any faction and he is absolutely stellar. I did just get my Gandalf to respect 5 today, thanks to the Matham Exchange. Uh, so you can go ahead and let me pull up his build. I was actually testing right before this video uh, a Respect 5 build against tiles, uh, 200 power tiles, and comparing that to if I just kept points in his top Respect 0 title. Uh, I actually did slightly mess up the build, potentially. Anyways, not in the scope of this video. Uh, Mithrandir, this entire tree is just amazing. So for the first four rounds, every single enemy is going to be doing less damage and it scales with Gandalf's focus. Additionally, your entire army gets to avoid the first instance of damage in battle. Gandalf, of course, has Convener, which I've talked about as being potentially the best skill in a vacuum in the game, letting your entire army potentially attack twice in the first two rounds, and importantly, giving them initiative, which means they attack first. He also has free peoples, men, elves, dwarves, and hobbits, which is pretty much every unit that you'll ever use on this guy. Minus 14% damage received, very respectable there. He has, for one point, just one point, guys, I think this could potentially, hopefully, maybe be changed in the future. For one point, on the first round of combat, two enemy units just get stunned. They just get stunned, because why not? I mean, if you compare this to Nazgul Screech, Granted, Nazgul Screech does some damage, but you have to put seven points into Nazgul Screech to guarantee the stun. Wizard is just like, all right, dude, you're stunned. Sorry, bro. I just think it's crazy. Anyway, it's just such a good title. Like, you don't actually have to invest in this, and it is super nice. The Gray lets him do a little bit of healing. Honestly, Gandalf will never put out a ton of healing, but it is... Just a nice skill. It just adds some sustain to your army. Fleeting movements is quite solid. Every third round, two allied units get like a 75% chance to evade the next instance of damage. Very nice there. Here's another kind of goofy thing. Blindside every third round. A uh, guy just gets stunned because why not? 
White Council, very powerful title in my opinion, particularly for PvP against evil factions because of the skills that are behind it. This is just some more damage reduction for Gandalf because, you know, he's just crazy like that. Champion of the Light, damage to Orcs, Urukai, and Trolls. This goes up to plus 28%, making it a very, very powerful damage boost to his army. And high alert, all allied units, focus burn and poison damage received. Uh, this is super nice because a lot of evil armies like doing lots of burn damage and having a way to counteract that can be extremely valuable. For PvP against good factions, I would not put any points into high alert or champion of the light because it's not going to do anything against them, obviously. I guess, I suppose if you're on a non-RP server and they're running around with alchemists or whatever it could but i just play on rp servers and i'm going to until they take them down so all of my perspectives are kind of with that in mind uh the jury is kind of out and i'd be interested in hearing people's opinions if you want to leave a comment on this video i haven't decided what's better white council or the gray plus fleeting movements i will say that if you're going to max out the gray you really want a smite carver for Gandalf. Most likely carver. Any smite weapon will be pretty nice because it has an extra attack potentially, which is another chance to proc the heal on the gray. Also, if you're going to be maxing out the gray, you really want to put two points in wizard and one point in surge so that Gandalf has another damage skill to again activate that extra healing. I feel like at 15 points, White Council is going to apply more damage reduction than Fleeting Movements, since Fleeting Movements only goes off every third round and isn't a guaranteed evasion. Um, but I'm going to do some testing and try to figure it out for sure objectively. Subjectively, my gut says that at 15-15, white council is better but would really be interested in knowing your guy's opinion on that as far as how this guy is doing like if you're in a good faction you've got to get this guy uh, let's see if i can pull up some 150 tiles here i think he took some earlier i mean this is just disgusting like it's just oh man <laughs> look at this one <laughs> three dead one wounded yikes uh, and I've already, I'm already farming 200s with him as well. We haven't even hit the one week point in our season yet. Uh, he does take pretty considerable losses, more than I would like, but I only have one T3 unit in these armies. These are T2 units. Uh, in the morning, when I wake up, I'm going to have a nice batch of T3s trained as I unlocked Bow Knights and also Cataphracts today. And I've been training them all evening so really be interested to see how he performs against these 200s uh, with that in mind, with a full T3 army behind him. So I just realized, and I kind of had a feeling that I was leaving something out, probably because I've been playing so much on my Season 1 server, but I've actually left out three Tier 2 commanders. It's going to be somewhat of an anticlimactic tier list here at the end since we've already done S and S plus tier, but I left out Imrahil, Eladon, and El Rohir. And somehow El Rohir is not on this tier list, but if he was, I would put him at B tier. I can go ahead and get him pulled up in game. Overall, he seems quite similar to Arwen in that he has access to a pretty reasonable amount of healing, or so it seems. But when it comes to talking about Respect 5 Plus, if you're looking at Arwen versus this guy, I think that Arwen's Respect 5 title is significantly better than his, particularly because you really want to have a man, elf, and dwarf unit in your army, and that can quickly get pretty awkward when it comes to itemization, as items typically apply to one particular race of unit. So I think it would be really difficult potentially impossible i don't want to ever say impossible but i think it would be really difficult to maximize the potential of this skill and maximize the potential of his itemization simultaneously and i just don't think his other stuff is quite good enough 
to warrant anything higher than a B tier rating. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Let me know if I am. Uh, overall, I think he could potentially be a okay early game tile taker, maybe even a Belrog and Dragon Farmer on the weekends. If you want to do that with him, maybe you don't have access to Arwen or whatever it may be. Although, honestly, if you're good side, just use Dwalon for it anyway. So that's that guy. And also coming in at B tier, we're going to talk about Eladon. I'll go ahead and get him pulled up in game as well. So I think Eladon is actually okay. Uh, I think that he has some good stuff. Horsemanship being a respectable damage buff. Valve protection, not that great in my opinion. Uh, just the commander gaining initiative is kind of like, eh. If it was his entire army... That would be good, um, but that would probably be way too good at that point. I do think Elven Rider is quite solid, as this is very easy to activate because it's very common that you'll include Bow Knights in your army anyway as good factions, either for farming 200 tiles, which always have trolls, or for PvP if you're fighting against Mumas or potentially Mordor with their Tier 4 trolls. So I think he is a pretty decent commander. Uh, reinforcement, that's not bad. Flanking, eh. I'm not a super big fan of Half Elven Coalition and Boon. So to me, those are kind of dead skills. Uh, he does have 1% mice boost during combat. That's actually super bad in my opinion, as I think that percent stat boosts are particularly not very good because of the way stat scaling works. And then leader and march are also pretty bad so i don't think this guy is necessarily useless just because elven rider and horsemanship are quite good and you can never count out cavalry armies but he also has a fatal flaw of sharing an item with imrahil who is going to be coming in at s tier Go ahead and pull that back up, coming in at S tier there, and then we'll go back over to the game to check out Imrahil. This guy's respect five title, in my opinion, is quite insane. So if you only want to put one point in this bad boy, <laughs> for one point, you can give mounted units stun immunity and madness immunity. We've looked at some other commanders throughout tier list videos and commander guides that require you to put 15 points to gain just one of those effects. Um, Eowyn being an example, um, Gorbag being another example. But for one point, you can give potentially, probably your entire army immunity to stun add madness, which is crazy. If you take this to 15 points, you can get plus six HP. I don't know that this would be worth taking to 15 to 15 just for that effect, but the Stun and Madness immunity is certainly considerable to talk about. Mounted combat, I'm not a huge fan. Like 20% chance is just not that often that you're going to be doing damage. Like when it works, it's great, but most of the time it doesn't. Uh, Coalition, this is not nearly as good as like Gothmog's version of this because good side factions tend to have much closer, tighter damage ranges. So you're not looking at something like uh, alchemists that have, you know, that 4 to 14 damage range. Other than that, he has air, which I don't think is a particularly great skill tree. Uh, this being, in my opinion, a dead skill. I suppose if you're playing Gondor or Rohan, picking up nobility might be worth it. He has ally, though. This is pretty reasonable. So it's a heal when Manish units deal physical damage and it gives plus one HP to men. So this guy can potentially add plus seven HP to cataphracts, which is quite reasonable to talk about. Reinforcement, not bad either. Fortify, this is only active when defending, so it can be kind of awkward to use, but if you use this guy to guard tiles, you can take advantage of that. Fair is pretty nice because you can gain initiative also for just an investment of one point. Brawler, very solid skill. Same thing as Aragorn's Brawler. You know, really nice because most of the time enemy armies are going to be two melee units or three melee units. I think it's pretty rare that any armies run two to three ranged units, unless you're talking about Haldir. And Cleave, eh, 
does some damage. But overall, I think this guy can add a lot of value to cavalry units, very specifically to Gondor and Rohan armies. And that's why... Let me get back to the tier list. And that's why I put him at the end of S tier. I am a little bit unsure, I will say, on Imrahil. I think there's a chance that in the right situations, like if you're Gondor or Rohan, he might actually be S+. Plus, but at the same time, if you're not Gondor or Rohan, he might actually come in somewhere among the A tier heroes. All right, guys. Now I have completed the tier list since I added those guys that I forgot about. I do apologize for that. And that is it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something useful. Let me know what you think about this tier list down in the comment section below. And I'll catch you in the next one. Rise of the Phoenix, over and out.